my gosh, it's so amazing to be here. The, uh, you know, I have to say, uh, actually all getting together in person, how awesome is it? The, uh, woo! And, and I, I want to actually give a, a special thanks to mRNA for getting us all here today in person, all right? Round of applause for mRNA vaccines. You, you know, like think about this, right? Like how amazing is it that synthetic biology played such a big role over the last few years, right? Like we hear all the time, all these, it's like endless about the apps and your phone and, and software technology. But the reality is the last two years, the biggest thing that's impacted our lives was synthetic biology, it was mRNA, right? And so really, really, I think amazing time for us all to be talking today. Okay, so you're gonna hear about three things that I really love today uh, in the talk. First is Ginkgo, uh, second, iGEM, uh, and then third, I got the shirt on, GMOs. All right, so let's go through each one. Okay, so I love Ginkgo. Uh, as was mentioned, this is the, the Ginkgo founders back in 2006, iGEM. So we, we were advisors to the MIT team uh, that did a project called Eau de Coli. So basically engineering E. coli bacteria to smell like mint. I think while they were growing, it was mint. And then when it hit stationary phase, bananas. Okay. And so maybe unsurprisingly uh, for a bunch of eye gemmers, uh, when we launched Ginkgo, uh, we basically launched with an eye gem business model. Uh, and so what we do at Ginkgo is lots and lots of iGEM projects. So if you follow the company, you know, you would see folks like Novo Nordisk or Merck or Aldevron will come to us and ask us to engineer a cell for them, right? Like do an iGEM project. It's, it's a little longer than iGEM projects. Usually it's like a, you know, a year or a two year project, right? Um, or folks like Bayer or Corteva in agriculture will come and ask us to engineer a microbe for them. All right. And so why are they doing it, right? Well, the reason is that they want access to our platform at Ginkgo, right? And the idea behind this, and I'll, I'll, I'll put in a little plug, because I think, I think you all could plug into this platform too, that the, the idea is think like Amazon Web Services, right? So Amazon invests billions and billions of dollars into these giant data centers, and then they allow you know, startup internet companies and other big companies to access them by paying for services, right? So you don't have to spend billions of dollars, Amazon spends it, and then you just pay a service fee and you can access it. Well, that's the exact same idea that we're trying to do for the physical infrastructure needed to do the lab work of engineering cells. So up on the, on the left up here, you can see our, our facility in Boston, lots of robotics and automation. We spent close to half a billion dollars across software and automation and infrastructure in that facility. We just announced last week, uh, we closed on the acquisition of a company called Zymergen out in California. We're bringing their platform in and combining it to make the facility even bigger and better so that if you wanted to start a new company, you could just do it on the platform, right? And, and the idea here is startup companies are actually some of the best people to use this infrastructure because just like with starting a website on, on top of Amazon Web Services, you haven't actually built out the old way to do it. You don't already have labs and equipment and spent millions of dollars. You can start on day one on the platform. And I will point out, uh, for those of you that don't know, I found this on the iGEM website, more than 150 companies now have been started by iGEMers. You know, robotics companies like uh, Opentrons, Elego here in Paris uh, in the pharmaceutical space, software companies like Benchling, PVP Biologicals, has products, uh, pharmaceuticals going into clinical trials, right? And so there's a ton of entrepreneurial energy in this room. Um, and so again, I would, I would encourage you to, if you feel that, if that, you know, that's not the only road, but if that's a road you're excited about, I encourage you to go for it. Uh, lots of iGemmers before you have done it successfully. Um, you know, I got asked a lot for advice about like, hey, you know, and we could talk more about this with Oliver, you know, uh, you know, advice for folks that want to start companies. So I'll tell you a piece of advice you often get, which is, oh, don't start a company with your friends. Like it'll ruin your friendship or something, right? L like, I, I could not be more wrong. L like, like you should absolutely, if you're going to do something hard over a long period of time and try to build something important, do it with people you love. Right? I, I cannot emphasize this enough. This is probably the most important thing for Ginkgo success was that you know, I cared about these people. It was, it was like, like we could get through a lot of the tough stuff uh, together. And if you fast forward, oh my God, it's now 16 years uh, from when that photo on the left was taken. Uh, you know, this is at, at the New York Stock Exchange last October, ringing the bell. You can see, you know, four new little future iGemmers uh, have popped up in the picture there, uh, ringing the bell, right? Um, and so, so, you know, I, I think this is an important message. You've, you've built a lot of close relationships through the course of doing iGem. Uh, build on top of those to do the things you're going to do in the future. 
Um, I'd be remiss uh, not to mention that when we took the company public, we did put a 30-foot T-Rex on the outside of the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, thank you. Uh, and uh, this is uh, Drew Endy here on the left wearing that old 2006 iGem shirt. I, I think he doesn't like this photo. I think he's not like, like admitting how gray his hair is getting. And so I, I want to I just give you uh, a little, another mistake I see people making who are kind of coming into the field now. It's like, hey, well, you know, Ginkgo's gone public, Drew Endy's super old, like, <laughs> synthetic biology must be over, right? Like, like, I missed it, I missed the boat. And let me tell you, that is not the era we are in right now. If I, if I were to draw an analogy to the computer industry, this is the era we are in right now for synthetic biology. That machine you see there in the middle, this picture was taken in the early 1970s at MIT, okay? That was a mini computer. All right, so think about what was in front of this picture. 50 more years of technology progress. Basically everything interesting that computers were gonna do was in front of this picture, okay? That, that is synthetic biology right now. And by the way, uh, if you don't recognize the bearded gentleman on the left in the photo, uh, that is Tom Knight, okay, who I, I am quite, and let's give a round of applause for Tom, okay? So, I was very fortunate to have our fifth founder after that iGEM team uh, be Tom. And as I mentioned, doing things with people you love, uh, I think is critical. And we were, we were so fortunate to have Tom's wisdom shaping Ginkgo over the years. And you all are fortunate too, because his wisdom has been shaping iGEM as well, which is the next thing that I love, all right? So, why do I love iGEM? Well, I talk to many, many sort of like fancy CEO of Fortune 100 company, and they're like, oh, I need to find innovation. Tell me about synthetic biology, Jason. And I'm like, if you want to learn about synthetic biology, go to iGEM, and you will see the future. And I mean that two ways. Number one, the projects that you are all doing, OK? That is the future. Like, look at that project we did, you know, that MIT team did in 2006. Make mint, make banana, make, make fragrances and flavors. You fast forward five years, who are Ginkgo's first customers? Flavor and fragrance companies, right? The projects you're doing right now are the things that are going to be products, new companies, new, new uh, you know, NGOs, whatever it might be in the future. It is, it is right, you walk around the room right now and you will see it. The other re way that we see the I see the future when I come to iGEM is all of you. I cannot emphasize this enough. So that picture in the lower left, that was at the very first iGEM, apparently, and this is disturbing to me, 19 years ago, all right? It's like half of the startup, you know, synthetic biology company founders are in that picture. A lot of the academics now, they run giant labs around the, around the world. Like, I'm telling you, you fast forward 20 years from now, you all will be running the place. I guarantee it. And, and so people who want to see the future, want to see the people, they need to meet you, which is why I'm here all day. I want to meet all of you, all right? So please, come up, introduce yourself. I'd, I'd, love, to, I'd love to learn more about, about what you're trying to do, but, but don't forget that. Do not forget it, right? Like you are still in a, not many people know about SynBio right now. You're, you're in a very rare position. Um, so I want to take a minute and, and talk about uh, COVID, because I, I think it does touch on a little bit uh, something I think is important at iGEM. Uh, so there are not many things that touch every human being on the planet. Almost nothing, okay? Cultures are so different, countries are so split up, almost nothing hits everybody. COVID did. And, and it wake, woke people up to something they take for granted, which is that biology, and this is something we all know in this room, is very, very powerful. Like that is now common understanding globally. All right, and it just wasn't three years ago. And for all of us in this room, it reminds us of something as the folks building the technology that's going to make it easier and cheaper and faster to program biology, to design it, to engineer it, to do the things that we think are good. It reminds us that we have to go into that with great care, okay? That, that, that it is our responsibility as the technologists developing this to care how it is used. So how do we do that? Two ways. First, technologically, okay? So 
I'm excited, and I suspect around this room there are some folks who've been thinking about technological solutions to biosecurity. How can we make it so that infectious diseases are less likely to spread around? Are there biological solutions to that? What's the next generation of mRNA vaccines going to look like? Right, those types of things. And Ginkgo's worked on this, right? So, so during COVID, we set up a brand called Concentric. If the U.S. might have heard of it, you know, we we're operating in thousands of schools, testing weekly uh, students to try to keep schools open during Omicron during COVID. We ran a program with CDC at airports where we collect wastewater from planes and anonymous swabs from passengers, and we sequence the DNA. And we found the first cases of BA2, BA3 sequenced in the U.S. One of them 40 days before it showed up in hospitals. This is the beginning of like. A hurricane warning network, right? Like we should be watching, we should be monitoring for infectious disease, so we know when it's coming and we can prepare, and and we should have rapid responses when we know when we know it's coming, so that we're ready and and it's less of an impact. All of that infrastructure has to get built, and I would argue we all have a responsibility to build it because we are also building the technologies that increase our ability to design biology to do things, and people could use that maliciously, and so these types of technologies are needed to to, to help prevent that. So that's the technological side. Here is something iGem has been doing very well for 19 years on the social and policy side, and and I want to celebrate the very early iGem wisdom of including human practices alongside the technical development in the iGem programs. In other words, it's just as important to ask the question: What is the impact of this organism I am engineering going to be on the world? How did we think about it? Did we talk to the stakeholders? Is it going to be safe? Right? You know, th these these questions are part of being a biological engineer, and these are just a few. I, I pulled a few tweets down just of of, of iGemmers at the convention for biological weapons, okay, uh, in Geneva. You know, iGemmers at G7 talking about biology. Again, shocking to me, 70,000. More than 70,000 iGem alumni over the last 19 years now who are out there who have been educated on the importance of human practices and, and can help guide. And I would highlight it is as important as the technology. In fact, this is what's new about Symbio from when I was in it 20 years ago. We know it's going to work now. Okay, like that is a big deal. Right? It is a lot. It's it's both more exciting and scarier than it was 20 years ago. Because I promise you, the shit is going to work. It is it is hitting at scale. And so, more important even than the technology you're building is, hey, if this all works, are we happy with the world we built? Okay. And that and that is the human practices. And so, again, I would celebrate that aspect of, of iGem. I think it's so important. Um, okay. Another feature of iGem. This is from I, I think we talked about iGem three years ago. And this was the map. So it's about more dots now. Okay, unbelievably global competition. Okay, right? Unbelievably global community here at iGem. All right. Why is that important? So a little history lesson. So so this is a conference called the Pugwash Conference back in 1957. Albert Einstein, Bertrand Russell had ba basically put out a, a letter about nuclear arms control. And this was a gathering of eminent physicists. Okay, from the Soviet Union, okay, from from Japan, from China, from the United States, all over the place, who got together and then got together again and again annually through the Cuban Missile Crisis, through the whole Cold War meeting, okay, to talk about to talk as scientists as an international community, even as their countries became more nationalistic, as their countries split apart. And I, 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 I said this th three years ago at IGEM, but man, is it important now. You should spend time over the next few days, really getting to know the teams from other countries here at iGem. Okay, because you are all in this room because you share a passion for synthetic biology. I promise you, you're all here to a to a T because you think it could do a lot of good in the world. So get to know those people. This is our pug wash, right? Like, like this is how we are getting together as a community, especially with the young people where the energy is and the long-term leaders to talk about this kind of stuff. It is essential that it remains international uh, and global, especially as the world is changing around us. Sorry to put that on you, but it is okay. All right, I heart GMOs. This is maybe the one room where that's not so controversial. Uh, I will say. So. Uh, <laughs> The point I would want to make to you all is you should be proud, proud of GMOs. Okay, right? So we made you know this like 15-foot iHeart GMO sign that we drag around to conferences at Ginkgo. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a little nudge on sort of like 
how, to, how you should go out and be ambassadors to the world about this. And it, and it starts with being transparent, right? So we had a, an editorial in the New York Times back in 2016. This was right when the U.S. was debating GMO labeling laws. Like, should we label GMO food? Still a, still a topic, okay? But, but like, eventually they decided yes. But prior to that, we wrote this editorial, hey, I run a GMO company. I think we should label GMOs. And like, this is like a, was a hated opinion at the time by like, you know, scientists and engineers, you know, like ag companies. The, the argument is like, hey, they're scientifically safe, you know, like, like we just need to educate people better. Like if I could just show them this paper, like can I present my poster to them about the safety of GMOs, they'll get it, right? But, but that's not the reality, right? Like the reality of, of the issue with GMOs in food is an issue of trust. Do I trust the people developing this technology? Do I trust the corporations, the organizations that are deploying powerful technology to be operating in my interests? It's a trust problem. What destroys trust better than anything else? A lack of transparency. Like, I want to know if this is in there. Oh, no, I won't tell you. Right? So that fundamental transparency, to me, is important for trust building. And the way to play it is like, hell yeah, I want to label it. I'm so damn proud of it. Okay, right? Like that, that, that should be our footing as we go out and are ambassadors to the world for this technology. So to that end, uh, I'm happy to say today, actually, we, we have a, we, this is our version of ambassadorship uh, at Ginkgo. We put out a magazine every year called Grow Magazine. Uh, it is launched today. You are actually the first people who get to read it. So if you take a picture of that QR code right now, uh, you are the first people in the world who get to download the new Grow Magazine. Highly encourage you to do it. Uh, we're also assuming they show up. Uh, that's kind of cool, everybody taking their, hold on. Can I get a picture with everybody? All right. Say GMOs. <laughs> All right. So, so, the, so you know, this will you know, be also, hopefully, be getting a, a big box of these, and teams will each get a copy. But uh, you can read it today. And it's an issue about futures, OK? And so futures is another complicated topic. Right? Because I think a lot of people rightfully right now are like, future sucks, right? Like climate change sucks, nationalism sucks, war, you know, right? Like, like, like there's this general concern about the future and a sense that it's so big, I can't do anything about it. Okay? And last year's Grow Magazine had a great article about this from uh, Sophia Ruth, who's, who's an old friend of ours, she's an anthropologist. She actually studied old Synbio labs when she was in grad school at Harvard. And, and she wrote an, an article about this protest group of scientists and engineers back during the Vietnam War called Science for the People in the US, okay? And they had a pamphlet, and I'll read you an excerpt. It says, you can't direct that your work will be used for the benefit of society. You are as much a part of the machinery as that computer you're working on. Feel like quitting? Don't quit, brother. There's only one way to stop that frustration. And, and, and I think, by the way, like, feel like quitting? Yeah, yeah, people feel like quitting. Right? They feel like, oh, there's nothing I can do about this. Like, what's the point? Right? And, and their argument is, don't quit. All right? There's only one way to stop the frustration, to make yourself feel whole. The only way to stop that sense of frustration is to fight against the system that uses you so poorly. If you want to redirect science, you got to redirect society. Don't quit. Organize. And, and I think this is a really important point. Like, don't underestimate, actually, the power you're going to be gaining through this technology to have an impact in the world. And even if you are like, oh crap, like the system's so big, it's gonna eat me for lunch, it's gonna misuse everything I do, I should quit, you will not feel whole, right? Like you need, you're going to need to push back against those systems. And again, coming up in the world we are entering, we need it now more than ever. And the folks in this room, I encourage you to, to build a community that can do that. You're, you're some of the best people to do that in synthetic biology. Okay, last but not least, just a friendly reminder, Biology is effing magic, okay? So I give a lot of talks in Silicon Valley, and I like to show this slide. I'm like, hey, you know, like, these are some of the most advanced technologies in the world. Like, what's the most sophisticated one on the table? The houseplant, right? Like, the houseplant is obviously the most sophisticated one on the table, okay? It's self-repairing. Like, you break the leaf, the, frick, the, thing, the thing regrows itself. Imagine if you smashed your iPhone screen and then in the next week, it just repaired itself. Like we'd be hailing Tim Cook as a god, right? You know, it, it's self-assembling. You plant a seed, you add air, water, and sunlight, this thing 
builds itself out of thin air. Okay, right? Literally, no manufacturing plant, anything. It's pulling carbon out of the sky. It's producing solar panels to get the energy. Bananas, right? It's self-replicating. That's an insane concept, right? Like you have a physical object. Oh, it just makes copies of itself, right? Like imagine your iPhone just made copies, right? Like what would that do to Apple's margins, right? Absurdity. We don't even know how to think about this in the physical world outside of biology. Finally, it's renewable. Oh, you're done. You just throw it on the ground. Just melts away into the environment, totally friendly way, provides substrate to future growth, right? So at a macro level, biology is by far the most sophisticated manufacturing technology there. What about at a micro level, right? So look under a microscope, you guys spent a lot of time looking at bugs this you know, the summer, right? Like, see this little tails coming off the back of the bacteria? You know what these are? Flagella, right? So little, you know, little propellers that let bacteria swim. All right, well, let's zoom in on them. All right, over here on the left, you see a flagellar motor. Okay, that red disc spins inside the blue disc. 30,000 RPM rotary motor. All right, give you a sense of scale, lower right. That's an Intel semiconductor chip, all right? That 40 nanometer scale bar, those two things together are a transistor. There's billions of these on the chip, okay? Those two fins of silicon on the right. Electron micrograph here in the middle of that flagellar motor, same scale bar. So in the same area where Intel, with a $5 billion manufacturing facility, is placing two dumb hunks of silicon, biology is assembling thousands of atoms in a three-dimensional structure to make a functioning 30,000 RPM rotary motor for free in one of the puddles outside right now. Right? Like where, where is that level of molecular manufacturing on Intel's roadmap? 100 years out? 500 years out? We have no idea how to do this with our traditional engineering. Biology does it today. So you put these together, and at the small scale, biology places atoms better than Intel. Thanks to self-replication and self-assembly, think about industrial agriculture. Think about jungles. You have continent-scale manufacturing. So it's better at the small stuff, and it's better at the large stuff. So why don't we use it to make everything? And, and the answer now is, we are going to use it to make everything. The technology is working, right? It is fundamentally better than our other ways to do things. We are going to grow everything. And you all, by virtue of being in this room right now, with the next 20 years, not the last 20 miserable years I've slogged through in SynBio, but the next 20, where this technology is working at scale, you are the ones who get to decide what we build with it. And I cannot wait to see the world that you all decide to grow. I trust that you will do it with care. And welcome to the 2022 iGEM Jamboree. Thanks so much for your time.